as part of my consulting work with people across America, I get to see a lot of very interesting things. And one of the things that I'd like to talk about right now is mechanical plans. That's the heating and cooling and uh, water moving and water heating and, and ventilation and all that stuff. It looks very credible. Like all the things that are on this screen right now um, look like, wow, that you must be a professional to know how to do this. And in fact, this person is a licensed engineer. Um, the thing about it is, we've talked about this before, people who do commercial engineering and people who do residential mechanical engineering are very different. The main difference is the software that they use. So one thing that's a red flag that I pointed out again in a recent video is this right here. Let's look at this room, home office number one. Now we can, you can see we've got a lot of different systems. These are ducted or duct, uh, ductless mini split heads um, that are scattered throughout this big, very big home. This is like a 14,000 square foot home um, in New York. Uh, where there are lots of professionals and this like, you know, the center of the universe, um, according to many people. And it's like, they, they get things wrong a lot there too. That room is a classic example of one that has no load. Load is introduced by either stuff inside the, the room that's giving off heat, which a human, if there's one human in that home office, which is probably likely, that human is going to be giving off 230 BTUs per hour of uh, sensible heat, which is temperature heat, and 200 BTUs per hour of humidity or latent heat. That's not enough to account for this uh, two and a half foot long linear slot diffuser plus another foot long linear slot diffuser plus another two and a half foot long <laughs> linear diffuser. Um, that's a lot of conditioning to be given to a room that has no major equipment probably inside of it, maybe a computer or a laptop nowadays. Additionally, it has no exposure to outside, which is the other thing that gives load. So there's no walls that border outside. The thing over on the right is a sports court. It's an indoor basketball court. The thing on the left is the living room. We got a gym down below. Like there's nothing going on there. The floor is a slab, but that is a good six or eight feet below the grade, uh, below grade outside. So that's not enough to create the need for cooling in that room at least, it'll create a little bit of a need for heating, but only a tiny bit because the Delta T, which is the nerd uh, way to talk about temperature differential between the air, which is 70 in the wintertime, and the ground, which is like 60, uh, is very, very slight. So you're never gonna have the kind of heating that you're gonna need in the above grade areas of the house, this being the basement. So I just wanted to kind of point that out on the first page before we move on. You can see this is the uh, first floor. We've got a big garage over here. We got all these mechanical systems being scattered around the house. Second floor, again, lots and lots of mechanical systems scattered around the house. And now we get to the schedule. So the schedule is a very important thing to visit. First, I'd like to draw your attention up here to the fact that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 blah. like basically uh, in the teens number of systems. Each of those is going to need to be maintained. Each of those is going to have a filter in it that needs to be maintained and replaced at, at certain points. We equal 40 tons of cooling for this 14,000 square foot home. And what we can do is just take the square footage, divide by the uh, number of tons that we've got, and that comes out to 350 square feet per ton of cooling. This is supposed to be a high performance home. Now I'm going to get into in, a, in an upcoming video, why that 500 square feet per ton is there and what kind of a house that would be. And you're going to be surprised when you see that, but um, 350 square feet per ton is not even on the map. Like I, I could do that. That would be the worst house that any of us has ever even imagined being built. So really what this company is doing is a couple of things. Number one, this is a wealthy client. So they're trying to mitigate them being called. Uh, and the reason that they would do that is people who are very wealthy may do things like open up all the windows and the doors because they just feel like it today, even though it's freezing cold outside and have a party. Uh, they may do things like in the summertime, um, invite the entire neighborhood over 
and have a giant block party coming in and out of the house. And you've got like potentially hundreds of people coming into the house with their champagne, blah, blah, blah. And like, we've got all kinds of humidity and heat and things like that. So that's kind of what they're, they're just kind of building enough ammunition with enough different systems to try and take care of that. But I think that the other thing that is not clear to people is that the software that this company is using to do this load has defaults built into it, just like the one that we use on the residential side. And I have a video about the default air leakage, for example, uh, which I'm linking on screen now, that the software is assuming. So this software that they're using is a commercial software. Um, there are a couple of different ones. There's one called Train Trace. There's one called, um, uh, I use RHVAC. This one's called CHVAC. And it also builds in equipment which would be in, in a case of like commercial spaces, um, restaurant fridges or cooler cases or lit up like cabinets for putting jewelry in, things like that. All that gives off heat. It also is going to assume that in each of these rooms, there's like 10 or 14 people because they're kind of building it for what happens at rush hour when your store gets packed with people and they're all waiting around for you to become available and they're like hanging out on their phones and just giving your space heat. So all those things are being built into a home design like this, and they just don't apply. As we go down here, we can see that the exhaust that they've specified for this home is 1476 CFM. Now for a 14,000 square foot home, and let's assume, let's just play with the numbers here, that there's 12 foot ceilings everywhere because, you know, that's 168,000 cubic feet of air. I have had clients who have bigger homes than that. Um, for sure. So yes, this is a very big home, but like, it's not the biggest one that I've seen. We divide that number by 60 and it tells us what our blower door test would be at one ACH 50. Now in a very, very big home that's shaped like this one is, it's pretty easy to get really low ACH 50. If you test a Walmart, it's always going to pass the ACH 50 test because it's just so big and fat. Um, there's no other reason. They didn't do a good job air sealing it. It's just the fact that they're taking advantage of this giant fat airspace inside of it. So in a home like this, that's more barrel shaped, um, you're going to have the same ability. So, so let's assume that we're going to be able to hit 2,800 on the CFM 50 for the blower door. We might even do, do better than that. Um, 1476 CFM is more than halfway to that blower door test. So if we turned on all the exhaust fans in here, we would be doing half of a blower door test, just to be clear. That's another kind of red flag that's like, ooh, why is there so much exhaust? Now, the ERV that we've specified here is a, um, what did they say? I think it's like a fan tech, but it's a commercial fan tech. They spec an 1800 CFM ERV, which again is half a blower door test worth. Um, what that one ACH50 number, 2,800, also represents is one air cleaning per hour. So if we divide that by this, we're going to be actually cleaning all the air, replacing all the air inside this home. If we run that ERV on max speed, every hour and a half, all of that 168,000 cubic feet of air will be replaced with outdoor air. That sounds like a nightmare, to be perfectly honest with you, which is partly why they did this next thing and specified a 90,000 BTU ERV heater. 90,000 is bigger than most residential furnaces um, that I have tested in high-performance homes. And again, this home is supposed to be high-performance. They're using WRB sheathing. They're air tightening up. They're talking about aero barrier. They put all this nice insulation all over the place. So no reason for that because we're just not going to need that much. What we actually find when we run the calculation on this for ASHRAE is we need something like 350 CFM of exhaust air, uh, excuse me, of balanced ventilation for this home, which 1800 is obviously like five or six times that. So we're not going to do that. Now, when we uh, look at another plan, let's look at this one. This is a one pager. My client the other day showed me this and said, this is our mechanical plan. And I was like, okay, well, without a manual J, I can't really tell what is going on here, but there are some red flags that I will show you in just a moment. And my client said, oh, okay. I thought this was a manual J. It says right suite universal. It says manual J right up here. Um, I thought that's what this was. And like, no, this is not a manual J. This is some, some reference to a manual J. I think that this manual J does not actually potentially exist. 
Um, now I'm not trying to pick on the guy who built this, but the fact that we've gotten all the way to specifying the particular kinds of grills that we're going to put on the supplies and the returns, um, what you always start with is the manual J. Every other calculation, the manual S, which is the equipment selection, the manual D, which is the duct design, and in this case, the manual T, which is the termination, uh, the, the grill selection, hinges on that manual J. And this is why this manual J, I don't think exists. If we look right up here, we can see that number one, they did the manual J for the whole house. Let me take you over here and show you. These are bathrooms. This bathroom is getting 48 CFM of supply air. That's supply conditioning, heating and cooling. For a room that size, no way. Not in a high-performance home. Um, all, almost always below uh, 10 CFM. And it's because the only loads in this room, in this case, it does have, it's a, a, over a vented crawl space. It's got this one wall right here which uh, does not have a window in it, I don't think. It, it might. But, uh, and then it's got the ceiling. But the wall insulation is pretty good. The ceiling insulation is R49. This is in California. Like, you just don't need that much stuff. So the fact that they're really going above and beyond is very useful. So that is a red flag. Also, this number right up here, this powder gets 14 CFM. No way. That powder has almost no load in it. It's got ceiling and floor only. And I can guarantee you that that is not needed. So we go back up to our manual J design parameters. So the whole house is a key giveaway here. That's called a block load. Um, that means that the, we did not get the amount of BTUs that are needed by each room. So that's why that powder room is getting 14 because they just divvied it up now proportionally based on the square footage compared to the house, not based at all on the actual load of each room. So it's possible that some rooms that have lots of windows that face the wrong way, meaning for the sun, are going to be undercooled in the summer at that certain time when the sun is coming in through them, and that other rooms are going to be overcooled, and likewise, you know, vice versa in the wintertime. Now, the cooling load here is five tons. This is a 2,400 square foot house. So what we're going to do is take our square footage, divide by our tonnage. There's 12,000 BTUs per ton. So 60,000 BTUs is five tons. And we get that number right there. 480 square feet per ton is the punchline to a joke. And the joke is that all HVAC used to be sized for 500 square feet per ton. I have a video coming about why it, it's like that and what kind of a house that would be. So um, please subscribe to make sure that you catch that. But uh, that 500 square feet per ton, rounding up, is even less than that, means that this was rule of thumb sized. There's no way that this house, which has been uh, spray foam insulated, it's got airtight uh, design. They're talking about aero barrier even. We've got all kinds of different, they're going so tight that they're going to use an ERV to exhaust from the bathrooms. We've got insulation that's above code in all of the different assemblies. It's just not possible that that is the load. So giant red flag. We know that the rest of this is potentially very weird. Um, the external static pressure here that they've specified is 0.8 inches of water column. Don't design ductwork for to, to deal with a 0.8 static pressure. That's basically blood pressure. It's saying, oh yeah, we could design this human with a really high blood pressure if we need to. That's just not a good idea because the heart's going to have to work a lot harder and the, they're just not going to feel as good. The quality of their life is not going to be as good. So if we're chasing performance. Let's design it for a better, um, a better static pressure, which would be 0.5 max. This is another reason why that doesn't make any sense. The friction rate here, the friction rate that like guys who are just doing a, a you know, a basic rule of thumb duct sizing would use is 0.1 for the friction rate. 0.08 friction rate would be even better. You may have to design duct work in really high performance homes with really long duct runs with like a 0.06 or a 0.04 friction rate. And that means that we're trying to like not hurt the airflow with the ducts. So the fact that they're saying, oh yeah, we can have a higher friction rate. And it's because we're aiming at this 0.8 inches of water column on the static pressure. 
That's totally unnecessary. You could do it with a 0.08 and not have any problems at all. And that would cut your static pressure by, uh, you know, basically a third if you were to do that. Dehumidification system. This is kind of interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly, and I have a full video on like how to do these calculations, but this, this 0.85, 85% minimum, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but he's calculated the latent and saying that we need a 62.1 pint per day dehumidifier. Therefore, let's buy a 70 pint per day. That's a mistake too. Regardless of what the actual latent need is in this top calculation up here, which again, I'm not completely sure, that 70 pints per day rating on that April air uh, dehumidifier that they're specking, and it would be the same in a Brone dehumidifier. Brone makes bigger ones than April air. April air makes 70, 100, and 130. Brone would make a, a 98 or a 70, 98, 120, 155. Um, and then Santa Fe makes one that's 205 pints per day. All of those are kind of BS, those ratings. And it's because they're rated at 80 degrees, 60% relative humidity. As soon as you turn on this dehumidifier, it should stop being 80 degrees, 60% relative humidity, even if it started there, which you probably didn't inside of a home. We use our psychrometric calculator, my wheel calculator that I love, which I have a video on, um, and we turn it to 75 degrees, or let's see, 80 degrees, 60% relative humidity gives us a... Uh, grains per pound of 90 grains per pound. That's how much actual water there is in the air. If we keep that there and we just look at what it would be at 75, that's 70% relative humidity inside the house. That's going to be super uncomfortable. No one would start, hopefully. I mean, like if you had a major problem, you started it there. Great. As soon as it starts running, it's going to dial way down and it's not actually going to pull 70 pints per day anymore because it can't, because there's just not that much water in the air as it's running. So it's not going to pull 70. Therefore, we need to upsize that. I would go with a 100 on this house for sure, if not the 130, just as an extra insurance policy. Last red flag, ventilation, 179 CFM of fresh air needed. Again, no. Very easy to run this calculation. You can just go to Red Calc, um, which is online. You can search it. It's a free tool. I use it in a bunch of my videos and run the ASHRAE 62.2 number and find out that for this number of bedrooms, plus one gives us the number of people. And in this case, we got uh, four bedrooms, so five people. And the size of the house with the volume uh, accounted for and the location, this house needs 110 CFM of ventilation. And even with the exhaust count, which, you know, always we, we got to figure out what the ASHRAE recommended ventilation and then also count the exhaust because we're going to use the ERV to exhaust from the bathrooms. Even that is 120. So we're like way oversized, at least 50% oversized on this ventilation calculation. So that's, again, boosting the amount of load that this calculation is assuming that we're needing, even if the manual J was done with all the other inputs being correct, which it's, it has not. Um, so they're recommending then a 260 CFM uh, ERV, which is, again, more than double the size that you actually need. So you can see that this is all stuff that is easily uh, analyzable using common sense from the things that you learn on this channel and on Matt Reisinger's channel and all the other things that you're learning on YouTube. Um, make sure that you like, don't take our word for it. Look into this stuff and for yourself and read this stuff. Look around as you walk through buildings and look at where you've got a room with no load. Is there a conditioning vent? Is there air coming out of it that's hot or cold? Why? Why is that happening? Uh, once you start asking these questions and then you start maybe giving a little bit of a hard time to the people who are designing this stuff, like me, and saying, hey, I want this done this certain way and, and I know enough uh, to be dangerous, which is where plenty of us are, I think that that's a really good thing. We need more people to be educated on YouTube uh, because there's just not enough time in the world to read all the books, to become the expert, to get the licenses and, and all that stuff. So we need to work with the professionals because they have all the training and the tools and the, the experience, but we need to bring this new engineering level of like, hey, let's do the math right first to make sure this gets done. Question, comment below, like it, subscribe. Tune in next time.